Welcome everybody to the second installment of the Harry Ransom Center's new Collections Connections series. Um, I'm Aaron Pratt, the center's Carl and Lily Forsheimer Curator of Early Books and Manuscripts. Um, and if you missed it, do check out the center's YouTube channel and watch the first Collections Connections entry where performing arts curator Eric Caleri and UT English professor Janine Barkas discuss Arthur Miller's radio adaptation of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Um, and to be sure that you catch future events like this one and to make our programs and marketing teams happy with me, do consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and or following us on our various social media channels. With me today is Devin Fitzgerald, curator of rare books in the history of printing at the UCLA Special Collections Library. He recently graduated from Harvard with a PhD in history and East Asian languages on the strength of a dissertation, The Ming Open Archive and the Global Reading of Early Modern China. He's an absolute pro, and you're about to see why an expert in East Asian printing can help us think through the question that serves as this event's title, a title that Devin came up with, um, I might add, what did Gutenberg invent? So just so you can see where we're headed in the next like 20 odd minutes, um, I'm going to offer some framing comments. Devin will jump in and take us to school, and I'll swing back in. Devin and I will chat for a bit, and then we'll try to answer some questions. Um, and along those lines, or to that end, feel free to ask any questions in the comments um, as this conversation goes on. And our behind-the-scenes wizards uh, will be feeding those questions so that I can address them when we get to that time. Um, and before we get going, I'd also like to thank those wizards that are behind the scenes here at the Ransom Center, the ones who have made this event possible. Lisa Pulsifer, the HRC's head of marketing, um, sorry, head of public programs and education, Randy Ragsdale, our communications and marketing manager, and Doug Newell, senior media support technician. And of course, I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in, whether live right now or down the line when this shows up on YouTube. So as many of you will know, the Ransom Center is home to a textually complete copy of the so-called Gutenberg Bible, a large format book that was designed to be bound as two volumes. It was completed in Mainz, Germany in or around 1455 using a new method for mass producing books and other documents that we usually refer to as movable type letterpress printing. Now I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Um, so this, um, as many of you will know, is a photograph of what I like to call, and not all that euphemistically, the center's Gutenberg Shrine, um, a permanent purpose-built exhibition that more or less immediately confronts visitors as they come in our front doors toward our galleries. It has pride of place and is, at least in part, responsible for bringing many visitors to the center each year. And yet, um, as the curator of all things ye olde at the Ransom Center, I found time and time again that visitors, students, sometimes myself, we aren't really sure what the Gutenberg Bible is or what it represents in history. I'm on the most amusing end of the spectrum. I've walked by somebody saying that it's the very first Bible. And I even once heard somebody say that, well, here is the first book. More usually though, what gets described um, or the Gutenberg Bible gets described quite understandably as quote, the first printed book or with a bit more precision, quote, the first printed book with movable type. Published scholars with fancy degrees use these labels all the time too. But neither is true without further qualifications. And the center itself, like other Gutenberg holding institutions, hasn't always been the best about offering those qualifications. Um, for example, the wall panels in our display of that exhibition that I've got on the screen still describe it as, quote, the first substantial book printed with movable metal type. What's missing, even in our description, is any mention of a rather different printing tradition in East Asia that goes back at least to the 7th century, the 600s, more than 800 years before Gutenberg, and that remained vital and current well into the 19th century. I think it's important to get East Asia into the story here, not only because it helps nuke what's often implicit in discussions of Gutenberg's firstness, namely, a false sense that the West had some sort of unique purchase on technological development and whatever it is that we like to think of as the conditions of modernity. But also because understanding East Asian printing methods can help even the most Eurocentric among us better understand exactly what Gutenberg, his team and his successors were up to. Unfortunately though, 
the center's collections don't have the, the best representation when it comes to East Asian printing, making it a little difficult for me to teach the broader history of printing within the walls of the Ransom Center. So when this new virtual series was being pitched um, internally here at the Ransom Center, I knew that I had to invite Devin, who I've been discussing the history of printing with for years now. Um, and I'm gonna turn things over to Devin for a little bit, as I mentioned before, take it away. Thanks so much, Aaron. And I'd like to echo Aaron's appreciation for Lisa, Randy, and Doug for organizing this event today. Um, and it's a real pleasure to finally have this conversation more publicly. Uh, Aaron and I have been talking about the Gutenberg Bible together, um, as he mentioned, for a few years. And from my perspective as someone trained in East Asian history, but also interested in comparative history and furthering conversations and cultural dialogue, Approaching the Gutenberg Bible from an East Asian perspective allows us to arrive at a richer and deeper appreciation, not only for what's important and unique about the Gutenberg Bible, and I would never argue that there's, uh, that a Gutenberg Bible is anything other than a monument to culture and civilization, uh, but it also lets us understand what was new and what alternative forms of print culture could look like in the early modern and pre-modern world. So when Aaron and I first discussed this, uh, I was working on a, a little project redescribing some materials in the UCLA collection. And so pretty much at random, I chose the book that you'll see in this next image. What we see here is a pharmacopoeia, a medical catalog uh, that was printed actually after the Gutenberg Bible. It's a uh, Materia Medica by a figure named Tang Shenwei. Um, and Tang Shenwei uh, died in 1093, and shortly after his death in 1116, a large catalog of 1,748 different herbs and remedies which he assembled was published in China. And this book, printed in the 1590s, is actually a facsimile of the very earliest edition that we still have today, a 1226 printed edition of Shun's Materia Medica. Now, there's a lot about this individual book that's particularly interesting, but unfortunately, we don't have time to get into it today. Instead, I'd like to talk about materiality and how we can understand the real differences between European and East Asian printing traditions. So in this single image, we see three major points that I'll uh, emphasize today. The first is that there is something different about the paper. And paper as a material substrate for printing determines what sorts of technologies can be used to print. Next, I'll briefly talk about uh, letter forms, character forms in this case, and their relative conservatism in China. Finally, I'll talk briefly about printing. Um, so in this next image, um, I'd like to point out two other objects in UCLA's collection. On the right here, we have a book printed in 1109. On the left, we have a book from 1447. And at first glance, you'll notice something quite remarkable, which is that first, the character forms are more or less the same still. That's because beginning really in the third, fourth century in China, a new form of writing called Kaishu um, developed, and that essentially formalized what Chinese characters would look like uh, in manuscript and print production uh, until contemporary China. So one major difference is that a modern Chinese reader looking at either of these books from 1109 or 1447 would recognize the characters. They may not be able to understand classical Chinese, but there is a sense of sameness. So that relative fixity of character forms meant that the tradition endured in fundamentally different ways. The next thing here we can observe is these different types of paper. Um, Chinese papers, unlike pre-modern European papers, were actually made from raw plant fibers. Uh, and these were processed over a long period of time into something like this, a very thin, flexible paper. So these books are printed on one side, then they're bound together. Uh, and then you get something that's a very, very flexible when it's in a final book form. So Chinese paper is a lot thinner than say a pre-modern European paper. Uh, which is rigid and doesn't take to bending quite as well. 
And then the final point I'd like to make will be about print surfaces. So even though in East Asia, movable type emerges uh, around the 11th century, uh, movable type never becomes the primary method for printing. And there are lots of reasons why movable type isn't necessarily preferred in East Asia. Uh, but in this image here, I just like to point out that uh, wood blocks are flexible and they allow for different aesthetic considerations. So here we have a uh, page and image integrated into a single, uh, single printing surface. Uh, and then this is quite simple. Once you've got your wood blocks, you can store them. Uh, this in UCLA's collection is a wood block from the 1790s and we can use them today to print images. Or this wood block here uh, from my own collection at home, which is a perfectly good legible wood block. Um, and I use it for printing and print demonstrations today. So that one act of commissioning and carving a wood block meant that you had a surface for printing that could be used for not just decades, but perhaps hundreds of years. That was also open to uh, different forms of mise en page, mise en page, and page layout. So, in terms of the typology, those are sort of three major differences I see um, immediately worth discussing when we talk about what did Gutenberg invent. Um, and with that, I'm going to toss it off to Aaron to give a little bit of rundown on his perspective. Yeah, thank thank you very much, Devin. I I think that's super helpful. And I, and I, one thing I thought that that it would be useful for us to dwell on a little bit together um, right now, you know, before I sort of take us deep into Gutenberg territory to this thing, um, is to think a little bit more about the the paper. Um, you know, you mentioned, of course, that the paper has different sort of material characteristics that that lend differently to different kinds of binding, different kinds of use. Um, could you say a little bit about the about paper cost um, in East Asia? Because I think that's one of the, you know, you talked about how paper making methods are different in Europe and Asia. But one of the things that I think is critical for understanding what Gutenberg is up to and why the technology that he and his team developed takes the form that it does has to do with um, the relative price of paper in Europe relative to East Asia. I mean, what, what kind of value did, did paper have um, in the period, the, kind of around the same time, um, a bit further east? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. Um, and the one thing to understand about East Asian paper manufacture, unlike European paper manufacture in the pre-modern period, is that in East Asia, paper makers were often agrarian. Uh, so they were situated in the countryside and almost every household, if they desired, could easily participate in paper manufacturing processes. So all you needed was bamboo, uh, some running water, lime, and then you could produce paper relatively affordably. And so paper in East Asia is much, much cheaper very early on. Um, we have toilet paper being used in the seventh century in China. Right. Um, whereas, you know, in Europe, it's tied into uh, primarily urban processes of rag collecting, uh, which already makes things much more expensive. Uh, and then the level of uh, processing to get from rags to paper uh, is relatively higher than what happens in East Asia. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's crucial, you know, because I mean, there's been a lot of work, I think rightly in recent years to sort of reevaluate um, a lot of what sort of European printing scholars or historians of the book have sort of overemphasized the price and value of European papers saying, and you know, often paper gets described in sort of like late medieval Europe as a luxury item. And I think there's been a lot of really important um, revisionist work to sort of show that even writing paper was a bit, um, a bit more down market than I think some have sort of caricatured it into being. But you're absolutely right that you know European paper manufacture required not just a little bit of running water, but a whole hell of a lot of running water, um, both to um, you know wash the impurities out of the paper, but also to 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 manage the process of mashing it up and prov providing the basis for the pulp that makes the paper itself. Um, and I, I mentioned the sort of paper cost thing because I think it helps us understand um, something that really differentiates. Um, Gutenberg style movable type printing really from um, the process that you describe in earlier types of European printing. Um, here on the screen, this is the, these are the very first two pages of the Ransom Center's Gutenberg Bible. So you've got 
the front or the recto on the left here. And then if you flipped it over, you've got the other side. So it's not the first two leaves, it's the first two pages. These are both part of the same piece of paper. Now this seems kind of obvious, right? Like European manuscripts were written on both sides. Um, manuscripts have always been written on both sides of the paper. But one of the things about the printing method that, that Devin described to you is that there was no press um, in Asian xylographic printing. Um, this meant that it was a lot less overhead to do the printing itself because you really needed the block you cut, the ink and the paper, and then you could you know, brush the ink onto the block and then you could rub the, the paper against the block to make the impression. So if you've ever done like linoleum block printing, um, sort of one of the lower key ways that you can do lino printing is just to rub the back of it. And so Asian xylographic printing, because it is rubbing the hell out of one side of it, you can't print on both sides of the sheet. Um, and so when Devin sort of held up that sheet of paper, and if you could hold it up again, it's printed only on one side. Um, and as you know, Chinese printing standardized, the method of printing on one side and folding inward and then sewing along the, not the folded edge, but the, the two open edges, that becomes the way that you make books in East Asia because you're printing on one side. Um, one thing that I think might help explain why Gutenberg goes to the hassle of developing this elaborate press, um, and you've all probably seen pictures, I didn't even come up, bring a picture to, of the press to this discussion, is that press, um, the Gutenberg press, what I think defines it more than anything else is its ability to apply even pressure across the surface of a, uh, across a printing, uh, across a sheet of paper in an inked printing surface so that you can pull the lever and have a single exertion of force on its surface and then it relaxes. It doesn't move side by side. And, and because of that, and because of some of the, the more technical ways that um, paper is affixed into a Gutenberg style or, or 15th century printing press, early modern printing press, it, um, doesn't actually damage what's on the, on the other side of the surface to be printed. And that means with a Gutenberg style printing press, which we don't know exactly what it looks like, but the printing presses that we know about from the 1490s and the 16th century, the, the letter press that you'll see illustrated in discussions of the Gutenberg Bible, what I would say that it does maybe more than anything else, aside from generating efficiencies, is it actually allows you to print the paper on both sides. And I think that's really crucial um, in a context where, you know, block printing methods that were available to Gutenberg um, couldn't do that. And so, you know, one thing that, that doesn't really get discussed in super, you know, the sort of everyman discussions of um, European printing is the block book. And a lot of folks listening to this presentation will know what these are. This is a block book that's at the, the Ryland, John Ryland's library in Manchester. Um, this is a book that was produced a few years, um, probably a couple years before Gutenberg printed the Gutenberg Bible. And this is a book that was printing with a wood block by rubbing um, in much the same way that in, in a roughly analog way to what Devin was just describing. And on the right there, you can see the blank back of it. Um, in Europe, one of the ways they dealt with it, they didn't have a, the same binding method that, that Devon's books did or these, these East Asian books did. So they would often paste together the blank backs of it to get a book that actually, as it functioned, um, had image on both text and image on both sides of it. But you're still wasting half your paper um, with a block printing method. And block books in this period don't really get very long. Um, I think they, my understanding is that they sort of kind of run up against 50 printed pages or 50 leaves kind of at the high end. And that's something that really Gutenberg's team would have understood as something they had to overcome if they were familiar with either Asian xylographic printing or European block book printing. And so I mentioned that up front because I think that's not something I ever thought about in a serious way before sort of thinking about the printing methods um, in East Asia is that really Gutenberg's team, the press is solving a major problem for European book producers that want to mechanize things just at the level of paper and double-sided printing. Um, when we get to the type itself, um, you know, there is, I mean, obviously this is a bit of a different story than what Devin describes with the stability of, um, at least in the example he was talking about the Chinese character set that's devolved, evolved, this de that develops to make um, it possible to print books the same way 
um, for a very long period of time that are legible across time. Um, we don't really know how Gutenberg printed um, his books, but one of the things that I think is important to mention here, and I think this also, you know, well, let me back up a slight bit. I think just the last thing I'll say about, about paper, because I do want to make sure I get this in there, is that in order for Gutenberg and his team in Mainz in the 1450s to be able to even conceive of printing a book like this, there had to be an existing infrastructure out there for making it the paper um, and also for preparing parchment. Um, some of you may know this, but there were, um, there were, there are about 150 to 200 copies of the Gutenberg Bible that were printed, about 150 on paper, we think, and about 30 printed on calfskin parchment. Um, just to kind of cut to the chase, that means that for the, the Gutenberg Bible edition probably took about 40,000 sheets of paper in the prepared skins of a bit under 5,000 calves or, or you know, small cows. Um, that I think should remind you just that th these kind of social and economic and industrial dependencies um, that, that printing requires or that, print, or that something like Gutenberg's invention depended upon. And I think, you know, one of the things that I think Devin can certainly speak to very well is just sort of how much paper manufacture there was in East Asia, especially prior to the large Asian printing booms. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I think that what you just set us up for is really a brief discussion of some of the issues that are a bit at the heart of our conversations, which is yes. uh, ways to overcome this stereotype that somehow movable type letterpress printing in Europe is a precursor to modernity, that somehow it's more rational, uh, more systematic, more technologically advanced than a seemingly simple set of printing practices with, that we see in East Asia. And, you know, in a couple of our examples, uh, your examples, we've, we've talked a lot about, for example, places like Japan, where there is a moment of movable type in the 17th century. Um, and then they decide that it's not necessarily interesting or aesthetically pleasing and move on uh, to saturate the market with woodblock printed texts and textual objects. Um, and so I guess my question for you, Aaron, mm -hmm. yeah. um, would be uh, what in the European process do you see uh, in some way you would try and argue is, is important and fundamentally modern? Is there something in there that you would defend? I'm sorry, I, I kind of set you up with a, a big question there. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, oddly enough, actually, the division of labor. So, okay, so one of the things we often think about is the sort of hallmark of modernity is this kind of increasing specification of labor. I mean, there's something more we think about industrialization, but I think there's often a sense that you have in kind of increasing specialization because there are more producers of different types of goods. And there's a kind of broadly common market into which people know they can go to get the things that they can't make themselves. Um, and that, that there's a kind of division of labor that, that associated with that. You know, Gutenberg's process doesn't bring about that division of labor. It actually depends upon an existing division of labor. And so, you know, one of the things you can see on the screen right now, I think I still have it up, is that, you know, there's some manuscript on that page. Um, this is a kind of weird example because the red text here um, is in fact printed. Gutenberg and his team um, came up with the two color printing process that required each page with red on it to go through the press twice, but they abandoned that pretty quickly. And they abandoned that probably because it was a pain in the ass. But one of the things that made it possible for them to abandon that was the fact that they knew that anybody who bought this Bible could hire a scribe or have a scribe in, in their church um, to be able to write in the red themselves and to be able to decorate it themselves. They also knew that wherever these sheets of paper would be spread across Europe, Northern Europe particularly, that they also knew that there would be binders there that could bind it up. And so one of the things actually that allows Gutenberg's team um, to sort of hone in on just producing the black text is actually some, is a kind of division of labor that we often associate with modernity that is very much already in place in the, in the high middle ages, in the earlier middle ages. I mean, it, you know, people can push markets further and further back, but I think that's really important because what ends up happening oddly enough is that as printing kind of takes on is that it's kind of regressive in a way because 
readers in Europe within 50 to 75 years sort of cave to the efficiency of just printing black. And that with the exception of a few title pages and a few classes of books, you really don't see two color printing. Um, you don't see multiple color printing in Europe in as dominant a ways that you saw it in, in a manuscript environment before that. Of course, there were black and white manuscripts, you know, just ink and pen, ink and paper manuscripts, ink and parchment manuscripts before Gutenberg and after Gutenberg. Um, but one of the things is just how quickly the page goes to black and white, even for luxurious books. And so there's a kind of way that something that we actually would think of as kind of modernity is you've got more possibility, more division, more diversity is actually this kind of, I would say a kind of aesthetic consolidation that is caving to a kind of technological efficiency. If you want to call that modernity, you're, you're welcome to, um, but it's not the kind of progressive modernity that I think we often associate with printing at the level of um, intellectual advancement. Um, I tend to think about things in terms of labor. Um, and, and you know, when we're thinking about labor, um, printing really is not something um, that is, I think, emancipatory in any way at all. I mean, it, you, you start to see, you know, trade disputes among printers and binders. You start to see consolidation of capital um, in publishers rather than printers. And then, you know, the publishers are crapping on the printers who are crapping on the binders. And so there's, there's a lot of things that I think you might want to see as a kind of harbinger of modernity, I guess. But that modernity is one that, is, that, that at least strikes me as being a sort of dystopian one in which there's a lot of kind of collapse of diversity um, and, de and, and at least attempts at homogen homogenization. Yeah, I think, I think that is a, a response to that question I've never heard from you before. And so I really appreciate what you said about both the separation of different forms of labor and that this isn't necessarily progressive because of course, as we know, enslaved labor was a major part of uh, North American, uh, Euro-American print traditions in the 17th, uh, 18th, 19th centuries. Uh, and so I would say then my rebuttal would be that in some ways then Chinese printing is a precocious post-modernity because it was part of a series of choices households could make to supplement their income in different ways. So paper production, you could make paper on the side and supplement your income. You could invest in blocks with other families and then share the profits of the products of those blocks, um, either in the form of printed books. Um, and finally, of course, Chinese printing technologies allow for print on demand. There's no reason to sit around with a large stock of books when you can just wait for a letter to arrive ordering exactly the book they want. Uh, and so your investment is tied up in other ways. Um, and really almost anyone can engage in the printing process. Uh, there are a few curators uh, also in China who are teaching themselves how to uh, carve wood blocks, which mm -hmm. is really mind blowing to me uh, in the sense that it's an ultimately accessible technology. And I think one thing I like to think about is whether that's pre-modern, modern or post-modern. Um, and I, I think increasing, increasingly we're all sympathetic to the idea of owning our own creativity and different modes of producing um, interesting, profitable things is something that seems more 21st century uh, than necessarily 20th or late 19th century. Yeah, that's great. That's super great. And so I've got a, I've got a couple questions here since we're sort of running up against the hour. Um, so the first question I've got from uh, Bess from Facebook. Um, I'm really curious about Chinese movable type. Would each piece of type be a complete kanji with typesets consisting of thousands of characters? Or would the type pieces be different radicals that could then be combined to create complete characters? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in all cases that I have seen, the characters would be complete characters. Um, and that meant that producing a font of Chinese type was incredibly expensive. Um, yeah. Now in South China, there were families that would invest in creating complete fonts of wooden movable type. And so we see lots of wooden movable type and these would have been individually engraved pieces of type. Um, and in Korea, because of the expense, the uh, Joseon court, uh, Joseon uh, rules Korea, I think from 1390s up until um, like 1907 or something like that. Um, and that central court invests very heavily in casting full fonts of bronze movable type. And 
So for that reason, it gets very expensive. Um, but you know, there are also phonetic East Asian scripts that allow us to really consider this question about, you know, why didn't they go into movable type? Because they do sometimes, but right. by and large, they stick to um, xylographic printing. That's right, and that's a, that's super important to you. You know, we've we've spoken a lot about an article by uh, Louise Anhales, I believe is his name. Um, you know, about the sort of question of why it is that East Asia doesn't take up movable type printing. And there's a there's a kind of economic argument there to say that in fact, xylographic printing, woodblock printing was the rational economic choice um, for the, certainly in China, um, for the vast majority of books. Um, I mean, one of the reasons of course is the, the print on demand ability that, that Devin mentioned before where the blocks stick around forever. And so if you've got bestsellers, that, that's great. But also there, there does seem to be, and this is a, gets complicated when you introduce some of the vernacular languages and Devin and I have had this conversation before, but you know, the Chinese character set is, is, is massive. Um, and most Chinese books need a small number of a lot of different characters. Um, and so the particular type of movable type system that is associated with the European movable type development, and I've just got a, the last picture I'll show. Um, so I, I brought it out. So um, European movable type printing is quite a bit different than um, Asian movable type printing, even in its metal form. So, so Devin just mentioned that there's wooden Asian movable type printing, um, East Asian movable type printing, where you carve each individual character out of a piece of wood like you know, like with xyla, like with larger wood block covering, you just make it smaller at the level of the character. But then there's also um, metal movable type printing. Um, it's especially well known from early in you know, early 14th century Korea, um, where you get movable type that is cast, but it's but the letters are cast um, in a what's a temporary mold that is made out of clay or kind of sand. Um, and so every time you cast a piece of type, you destroy the mold. Um, and so you, for every piece of type, you, you still have to make the, one of the fundamental ingredients, which is the mold. Um, here on the screen, you get on the far left, a punch, which is a, which is a punch that is carved out of a very hard metal um, in the, with the shape of the letter on its surface. And then that thing is smashed into a softer metal to make what's called a strike. And that's the second thing. And then that strike is then filed down and refined to make what's called a matrix. And that matrix then can fit into a mold and make lots and lots and lots of pieces of type. You have a stable matrix. Scholars for a number of decades now have debated whether Gutenberg and his team ever came up with this. Um, in, their, in the immediate period, we know of this kind of movable type manufacture from the 1470s through some um, law, I think lawsuits and, and references to matrices in other kinds of documentation. Um, but we actually don't know if Gutenberg was doing something more like Korean movable type printing or East Asian movable type printing manufacture where you've got temporary molds that have to be recreated each time. But still, you know, when Gutenberg and his team are thinking about developing the first font of type, they're still able to imagine how whatever method they can come up with a kind of horizon of characters that is finite. And, and, and there are some complications in sort of why exactly you don't see um, you don't see more movable type creation in East Asia, um, but one part of the economic calculus has to be the amount of work you put into what you get out of it, um, and it seems that at least in part the argument has been made that at least in China the Chinese character set does kind of exert a negative a negative influence on the creation of the, the creation and use of movable type, but. I like that example, the example of Asian movable type, because it a helps remind us what is so distinctive about what, what ultimately defines European movable type, which is the matrix, that stable mold, which you can then sell and ship all over the place. You can actually sell matrices across borders to help with type manufacture. Um, and really without the matrix, we don't really have movable type printing of the kind that makes European printing what it was. Um, I've got a great question. I think this will be the last one we were able to get to. Um, do historians of East Asia consider the arrival of block printing to have had a significant social impact, similar to how scholars of Europe see the printing press as a catalyst? Can the, can the history of block printing influence our understanding of the social impact of the European printing press? It's a good question. Yeah, this is a really good question. And I think it's one we have to take 
pretty seriously. Yeah. Um, and one one thing that happens is this gets pretty quickly into a chicken or egg style question, which is in the 960s or so, 960s, 970s, uh, the landed aristocracy in China is abolished, just destroyed. Um, and with that, the abolishing of the landed aristocracy, the standardized examination system is instituted. So that means the way you become a government official is that you have to sit for a triennial examination on a canon of sort of classical philosophical um, intellectual texts. And that standardization, that examination system had existed previously, but it, when it was first instituted, there wasn't a necessarily strong central state to recruit government officials primarily through the examination system. So starting around the year uh, 960, 970, we start seeing printing expanding in massive, massive ways in China. Um, and that's because now there is a class of educated elite, formerly aristocrats, who have to study for these examinations. And this is one major difference between uh, at least continental East Asia's book market and how it develops and pre-modern Europe's, is there is always a strong central state at the center determining in some ways uh, tastes and consumption habits um, and patterns of textual use. And so the best sellers of 16th century China, for example, are often model examination essays. So that'd be like walking into a Barnes and Noble and finding two thirds of the shelves occupied with GRE prep, test, uh, prep books. That's, yeah. that's the type yeah. of material um, people in East Asia were consuming. Uh, and so in terms of creating what we think of as uh, major centralized states, I think we can really attribute the rise and spread of printing um, to that state growth uh, in really significant ways, just like we can think about printing and the Reformation and the, in fact, converse, which was the fracturing of Europe. Right. Yeah, you know, and that, that um, it reminds me too that, you know, one of the things that I've read about Chinese printing development is that you do, when you see that expansion, that printing boom in the 16th century and early 17th century, you know, while a lot of it is sort of taken up with these sort of standard texts, there is more of a commercial market that develops um, where you start to see a range of more vernacular kind of texts, you know, fiction, other kinds of materials. Is that right, Devin? Yeah, um, and that, that's totally right. Um, and... <laughs> You know, the market is pretty big in the 13th century for a variety of texts. Then the Mongols come, al mm -hmm. come along. Um, and then it gets big again in the 15th, 16th century. And I, I would say that, sorry, Aaron, I'm just okay. going to put one more thing in. Um, you know, the interesting thing we see is the case of Japan, where it's not until the island is unified under the Tokugawa shogunate. So really, mm -hmm. the year 1600, that's when commercial printing. Yeah begins in big ways because the market is integrated. So there is more, more demand for text in general. So, you know, political economy um, seems to have a lot to do with how we have to understand and interpret East Asian book consumption habits. Yeah, and I think, I think that's crucial because what it, what it shows is that you've got, you know, a kind of lag between the development and maturation of the technology, the various technologies of printing and these various booms, which suggest a kind of dis a disconnect that complicates any sense of technological determinism. And I think one of the things I really like about that example, where you see these kind of, as you say, kind of political economy or, or various other kinds of social and societal formation, if those are the conditions under which printing either booms or busts, then I think that that helps remind us that maybe in Europe, even though the advent of movable type printing is largely coincident with the expansion of markets, the expansion of commodity consumption more broadly, it might be a mistake to assume that, that, that the causal relationship is as unidirectional, I think is, is sometimes being caricatured. Um, I mean, e even, and I think even in some of the more complicated assessments of the um, the maturation and explosion of print in Europe, I still think there's an often an under emphasis on just how much work had been done to define a secular book market in the man, in the sort of in the 15th century, um, where you have these markets, these trade networks, these booksellers, these you know these scribes, these binders. The basic structure is in place 
for printing to come in. And you've got a commodity market that really right around the time that Gutenberg comes in is, is in the process of exploding. So that by the time you get to the early 16th century, there, there is an environment in which printing is likely to be taken up in, in major ways. And I think that connects really well with, I think, what you just said about these various moments, these political and social moments in Asia that result in different kind of boom moments for printing, um, that really the technology seems to be more subordinated to these broader kind of regulations of markets. Yeah, and and de 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 supply and demands networks than it does um, to the technology per se. Yeah, and I'll just one final, and it's yeah. no surprise then that 15th century Italy really becomes the cradle of print culture. Um, yes. And, yes. you know, they're printing more than everyone else. And so in Europe, it's often the competition between spaces and states that fires up the market. Um, and in some ways that gives us the illusion of a greater diversity, um, but it's actually because institutions in some respects are a lot weaker and more fractured than they are in other parts of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is really great. I mean, look, we could talk about this for hours. Um, and so I, I just would like to thank everybody for tuning in for our like zero to in the weeds discussion of um, the conditions of printing in the medieval and early modern world. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for coming. I'd like to thank Devin for taking the time to do this. Um, and yeah, that'll be that. Thanks so very much. Appreciate it.